Today is our second sermon on living on mission. And I think that you're more desires today to live on mission than ever. I believe it's your desire to live on point with the Lord. That, that, that you, you want to know what God is saying, and you're going to do your best to line yourself up with what God is saying and what God is doing. Amen? Amen. Go with me to the book of Jonah. We're going to take the book of Jonah. There's only four chapters here. We're going to give a little synopsis, and we're going to preach from the four chapters. Basically, the synopsis of the story. Most of us know the story of Jonah and the well. Some have discounted this as just a fiction. It couldn't have happened, so there's no way. So that story doesn't speak to me. But, but let me tell you something. You got to put your, you got to take your blinders off. God's big. How many remember about eight months ago, the guy up around, around Maine, the Cape Cod, that area, the lobster fisherman, he was down uh, fishing for lobster, and guess what happened? A whale came and took that man, swallowed, and he lived to tell the story. How many saw that in the news? Let me see your hand. So, so if that could happen, you say, well, that was just, just a little over a minute. It wasn't even that long, but let me tell you, that, to me, I think God gives us little signs just to say, hey, do you believe me? <laughs> Do you believe me? The story of Jonah is, is fascinating. It's powerful. And today I want to talk about stop running <laughs> and do God's will. If you want to live on mission, you got to stop running. And you got to do God's will. The Lord gave this message to Jonah, son of Amittai. Get up and go to the great city of Nineveh. Announce my judgment against it because I have seen how wicked its people are. But Jonah got up and went in the opposite direction to get away from the Lord. He went down to the port of Joppa where he found a ship leaving for Tarshish. He bought a ticket, went on board, hoping to escape from the Lord by sailing to Tarshish. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, you can run, but you can't hide. The Lord knows where you are. He's got your address. He knows you. He knows your name. He knows where you're headed. <laughs> and if you're not headed in the right direction, he loves you enough to allow a storm to come. He loves you enough for a fish to come and for you to spend some time in that fish, so to speak, so that God can speak to you. Not because he's mad or angry with you, because God loves you. Because he knows where fulfillment is found. Fulfillment is found in living on a mission. The sailors panic, verse 15, <laughs> and they picked Jonah up and threw him into the raging sea, and the storm stopped at once. And I love verse 16. It's a missional statement. The sailors were awestruck by the Lord's great power, and they offered him a sacrifice and vowed to serve him. I mean, these were, these were sailors. These were pirates, if you would, sailing the open seas, not afraid of anything. And the Lord spoke to them. It's a great missional statement of what God wants for all of us. And that is to be saved. Verse 17, now the Lord had arranged for a great fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was inside the fish for three days and three nights. Chapter 2, you have Jonah, a psalm that Jonah wrote. It's a, it's a prayer. And as he is getting right with God. And how many know there ain't nothing like a storm to get right with God in? Amen. The Lord talks to you and the Lord speaks to you. Chapter 3, Jonah goes to Nineveh. He preaches. The inhabitants of Nineveh hear the prophetic word. They repent, and the Lord shows mercy. How many are thankful for the mercy of God in your life? But are you appreciative for the mercy of God in others? Jonah, Jonah was upset, chapter 4. He's mad. He's angry. He's pouting. He says, I knew, Lord, I knew this was going to happen. I knew that you're just. I knew that you're compassionate. I know that you're merciful. I know you are ready to forgive. But, Lord, I don't like it. Because, Lord, I wanted you to bring judgment on those folk. And here you are giving them an opportunity. Let us pray. Father, we love you. We thank you. 
Lord, I pray that, that you would open our hearts to receive, and may we leave here today encouraged and strengthened. In Jesus' name, amen. Many people have a problem with the story of Nona, but L.O. Richards writes in the Bible Reader's Companion, he said, either God is capable or he is not. It is not the miracles of scripture that are questionable, but the critics' limited view of who God is. It's our limited view of just how big our God is. Let me give you a challenge. Expand your view of God. Take the restrictions off because God wants to do something big in your life. God wants to do something big in your church. God wants to do something big in our community. First thing I want to talk about is this. I think the story of, of Jonah is the story of this. God is in charge. It's a powerful story of the sovereignty of God. And let me give you a simple description of God's sovereignty as I see it. And the short of it is God is the boss and you are not. He's God and we are not. He is in charge. God rules and reigns over every situation, over every circumstance. And he will work and move in his timing, in his ways. For his purposes. The book of Job 36 verse 22 says, remember how great is God's power? He's the greatest teacher of all. No one can tell God what to do or accuse him of doing evil. Nobody can tell God what to do. He's the greatest teacher of all. My hope today is that we will know him as teacher this day. The sovereignty of God. A.W. Tozier in his book, God's Sovereignty, speaks about this in chapter 8 of his book. It says, sovereignty means God is supreme over all things, that he is, he is the one above. There is no one above him and that he is absolute Lord over creation. And the small circle of man's free will is permitted within the vast circle of God's sovereignty. And A.W. Tozier said this, if we are opposing God, we cannot win. But if we surrender and come over to God's side, we cannot lose. <laughs> if you're running from God, you can't win. But if you surrender, you cannot lose. If you're fighting against God and his plan, you cannot win. But if you come and surrender to him, you cannot lose. See, God's got something great, something miraculous, something unbelievable in your life. And he has a plan just for you. Can you say amen? amen. Something you need to understand is God's action flows from God's character. Write that word character. The character, the nature of God does not change. You can count on the nature and the character of God being the same yesterday, today, and forever. The character of God is good. The character of God is kind and merciful and just. All that God does is right and good. And it's in the book of Jonah that we began to understand the sovereignty of God. There's several things we learn from uh, the story of Jonah. God is sovereign over the storm. We see his sovereignty in there's a great fish. Some have said a well. In chapter 4, you see his sovereignty where he allowed this great big gourd to, to grow, to, to create shade for, for Jonah. And then there was a worm that came and ate and destroyed the big fruit, the gourd. Jonah was upset. All the while, God is showing him his sovereignty. And we see the scorching east wind of chapter 4 is also a demonstration of God's sovereignty. 
See, if you're fighting against God, you cannot win. But if you'll surrender, you cannot lose. If you stop running, you cannot lose. Because the plans he has for you are plans to prosper you, to give you a future and a hope. His thoughts towards you are not harm. They're not evil. God looks at you with the light. God desires to move and, and, and bless you and, and work and move in your life. Write this under D, lessons learned from the book of Jonah. Well, the first lesson is this, the absurdness of running from God. Another lesson we learn from Jonah is the importance of surrendering to the will of God. Something else we learn is the importance of repentance in our life. Repentance is more than saying I'm sorry because I'm caught. Repentance is I'm sorry because I've done wrong. And it's a turning from. It's a turning from and going in God's direction. It's also a story that we learn about forgiveness. That forgiveness is bigger than our limited view. It's a story about motives. God is dealing with the motives, the attitudes in Jonah's life. How many can be honest and say sometimes, you know what? Our attitudes are not right. Our attitudes are not good. And the Lord will deal with those things. Another thing we learn in the book of Jonah is this. It's not about one people. It's about all people. It's not just about the people that Jonah looked like or he liked. It was even about the people Jonah didn't agree with. May not even liked in his own political views. Because this gospel is about whosoever will. Let's talk, secondly, about a, a prophet in conflict. Now, you look at chapter 1, in the verse 1, it says, The Lord gave this message to Jonah, Get up and go to the great city of Nineveh. Announce my judgment against it, because I have seen how wicked its people are. So, it, it's clear. Get up, go, and announce. But immediately, there's a struggle. Write that word, struggle. Jonah was struggling with what God was asking him because later on we're allowed to know why he was struggling because Jonah understood the nature of God. He understood the character. He understood the sovereignty of God. He grasped it. He, he lived his life by it even though his decision was, was foolish to run. Jonah was very nationalistic. It was all about his people, his culture, his nation, his group of people. Truly, the book of, of Jonah is, is really a book about prejudice, about being narrow-minded. Let me give you an important note. God was about to confront and change Jonah's worldview. We talked about our worldviews last week. We talked about the importance of having a biblical world view. And we didn't ask God to give us a worldview of his love for humanity, his love for the lost, his love for all cultures, all tribe, all nations, all kindred, all people. We didn't ask God to help us have that biblical worldview as he would have us have. Hear me. I am thankful for where I live. I am thankful for being born in the United States of America. I'm thankful for the freedoms that we enjoy. But I am a Christian, a child of God first and foremost. And it's important that I understand the purposes of the Lord. And whom much is given, much responsibility is also entrusted. So with the freedoms that I have, I must use them for advancing the kingdom of God, getting in line with the will of God for all humanity, for my brother or sister of kindred spirit, people that look different than me, people that may talk different than me, people that may be from a total different background than me. I need to ask the Lord, Lord, give me a heart of love to see their soul. Because without Christ, 
they perish. But with Christ, they have eternal life. Jonah understood the nature of God. Now, you know this because you got to fast forward to chapter 4. This is after he spent uh, days in the belly of the well, nights in the belly of the well. He's had an encounter with God. He's obeyed the Lord. He went and preached to Nineveh. In chapter 4, he's upset. Why is he upset? Because he understood what this meant. Notice why he's upset. He says, Lord, you're merciful. Lord, you're compassionate. Lord, you're slow to get angry. You're filled with unfailing love. You're eager to turn back from destroying the people. This verse is a sermon in itself there in in chapter 4, verse 1 and 2. I mean, Jonah is accusing God of being good, and he's mad about it. Ain't that crazy? Ain't human nature crazy? God, you're good, and I'm upset because you're good. Because, Lord, I wanted you to do something else, and you didn't do it. Going back to chapter 1. The Lord told him, get up and go. And Jonah went the other way. What my observation is, Jonah wanted mercy when he did wrong, but he did not want to give mercy for others. And how much like ourselves, we want mercy when we've done wrong. Oh, but let somebody else do wrong. All right, Lord, zap them. All right, Lord, get them. Lord, you want us to call fire down from heaven. Isn't it strange how human nature is? See, Jonah's conflict came when he thought his plan would be better than God's plan. Can I tell you God is sovereign? God sees all, knows all. My plan is not better than God's. Your plan is not better than God's. Quit running. Get on mission with God and realize that his plan is the best. Can you say amen? Amen. The third point is this, a prophet running. Going back to chapter 1, verse 3, it says, Jonah got up and went in the opposite direction to get away from the Lord. He went down to the port of Joppa where he found a ship leading for Tarshish. He bought a ticket, went on board, hoping to escape from the Lord by selling to Tarshish. Jonah got up. The Lord said, get up. He got up all right. He went just like the Lord said, but he went in the opposite direction. What was his purpose of going in the opposite direction? To get away from the Lord. Why do we run? Why do we run from God? To get away from his hand in our life to get away from what he's speaking and saying to us. It's futile to run from God, but we do. It is meaningless to go against God, but we find a way. It is senseless to try to hide, but we try anyways. Let me give you some interesting facts concerning this story. Tarshish was believed to be a city in Spain. Nobody really knows. But many theologians believe it was a city in Spain, which represented like the other side of the world in those days. Nineveh was only about 600 miles from Jerusalem, but Tarshish as a place represented a place far, far away. Write this in your notes because it's so important. Tarshish means literally west. It's like God said, Jonah, get up, and I want you to go north and east. (laughs) And Jonah says, no, I'm going west. Some of you are going west when God said you got to go north and east. But you're going west. Now, your west may be trying to to jump from one job to the next job to the next job. Your, Your west may be from one relationship to the next relationship. Your west may be from this career to that career. Your west may be another house, another location, another church, another community because you're always running. You're always trying to flee and God's trying to plant you. God's trying to do something. God's trying to grow you. God's trying to develop you, but you're running west. You're running away from God and he's trying to get you 
planted because he's got something better. Where is your west? I can't answer that for you, but right now, you've identified about three things. The Holy Spirit just showed you about three different things that represents Tarshish in your life. Don't run. Surrender. You fast forward to the New Testament, the book of Acts. Saul of Tarsus is persecuting the church. He has a letter, a letter from the authorities, and he's headed to the road of Damascus because because he's going to find women and children and throw them in prison, jail, because he knows the heart to the Father is through the women and children. So he's looking for people that he can throw in jail, throw in prison, because they're following this man the way this Jesus. And it's on the way to Damascus, the light began to shine from heaven, knocked him off his horse. Hmm. And the Lord spoke to him. Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Who are you, Lord? Why do you keep the old English? Why do you keep kicking against the pricks? In essence, why are you going in the opposite direction of what I'm doing? But Saul was convinced he was doing the right thing. Some of us are so blind, we're convinced we're not running. And we need that Damascus moment. We need that light. We need that, that, that light bulb moment we call in counseling just to pull and say, oh, my God, I have. My hope and my prayer today is that you will get on mission. You will live on mission. I know it's your heart's desire. I know that you, do, you want your life to be in the center of God's will. Run no more. Quit kicking against the pricks. Quit going west when he's told you to go east. So instead of getting up and going north and east toward Nineveh, Jonah went west. Stubbornness will always lead you west when God says go east. Self-will will always lead you west when God says go east. Self-will always sends you in the opposite direction of God's will, which brings us to our last point. Stop running. There comes a point in our life when we got to simply say enough is enough. And I think if I would be honest, and I'm trying my best to be, all of us are prone to running. There's something in our brokenness, something in our humanness that we're prone to hide from God. And I began to think about that question, why do people run from God? And there were several things I came up with. One is this, they're angry with God. Sometimes we're angry with God because, because maybe, maybe you prayed for something and didn't happen the way you thought it should. And you're angry with God. You're upset with God. You feel like God's let you down. Maybe, maybe you thought the Lord would, would give you that new job and give you that new opportunity and your coworker got promoted and you didn't and you're upset and you're angry with God because at some point, on some level, you feel like God has failed you. So what happens is we run. Another reason some people run from God is we get narrow in our thinking. Narrow thinkers, they think happiness is found in doing their own thing. They think peace is found in controlling their own destinies. So they're, they're like the one who's trying to, to write the story. They don't want to relinquish control. So, so, so they take control of things. Hear me, let God write your story. It'll be a lot better ending than if you ever came up with it. Let God write your story. Let God have, uh, have control. People sometimes run because of hurt, because they're hurting, so they're hiding. 
And because of the hurt and the pain, we run. We run spirits. We run physically. We run intellectually. There's many ways that we run. Right, this sometimes people run because of fear. Because fear, fear, Lord, if I, if I do ask and do what you ask me, then I give up some level of control. See, Jonah was running for fear of God would forgive the Ninevites. See, often we focus on the Ninevites when really to me the story is about this man, about Jonah. And there's a Jonah in each of us. There's a Jonah that has his mind made up about people groups and about this this nation and that nation and, and this group and that group. And we don't want nobody changing our mind about it. Our mind's made up. See, there's a Jonah in each of us. And God wants to speak to that Jonah in you. Because he wants you to be on mission. There's a fear often in us. And fear will paralyze. Fear will keep you off course. People run because of loyalty to others more than loyalty to God. This is a problem today. We're more loyal to a group than we are to the Lord. Don't let your loyalty to others be more than your loyalty to God. The reasons are vast and many, and I'm sure you can come up with, with, with many more reasons. Quickly, in what ways do people run from God? People run from God physically, locations. I mean, you change from this place to that place, this church to that church. Let me tell you, one, one of the hardest things about pastoring today is a lot of people call you pastor, but you're really not their pastor. You really, you really are not, because you're not you're not given the ability to speak into their life. See, uh, you got to give a pastor the ability to speak into your life, to be honest and to let the Lord speak through him to you. Let me tell you what happens. We get our feelings hurt. So what do we do? We go down the church down the road and we stay there three or four years and five years. And next thing you know, he does something or she does something, hurts your feelings. You go somewhere else. You're running. In this area, and I love our area, I'm thankful for, I don't want to live anywhere else in the United States but West, I love uh, Winter Garden, Okoye, Apopka area. This is the best place to live and raise a family. But listen, you can run all day long in a circle around here and keep running. And the only one knows you're running is God. The only one knows you're running is yourself. A lot of times we run intellectually. I mean, we check out. We check out intellectually. Write this. We run emotionally. Some of you have already checked out emotionally. Some of you say, I don't like this sermon. I'm checking out. Uh Uh-uh. I don't like it. Uh Uh-uh. He ain't talking to me. I wished I didn't show up today. Today was the day to watch my live stream. You at home, I'm sorry. Don't be offended. Put your big boy pants on. Come on. I'm sorry. My mama taught me better. I don't know how that translates over into Spanish, but somebody, that, that may not be good. I'm sorry. If that's offensive, I apologize. Emotionally, we run emotionally. Man, sometimes we, sometimes in our, in our marriages, in our relationships, we've run emotions. Some of you are running. You've checked out from your spouse emotionally. You're there, but emotionally you're gone. Some of you are physical in body, but you've checked out emotionally. You're thinking about, I can't wait till they get to Starbucks. I can't wait to get to the steakhouse. I can't wait to get down the road because you checked out emotionally. Another thing, you check out spiritually. Church, I don't want to check out. I want to check in because if I check in, God's going to speak to me. God's going to do something. God's going to change me. And oh, hey, if you know me, you say, pastor needs to be changed. <laughs> you guess what? I, I'm, I'm in good company. <laughs> Y'all are slow. <laughs> Y'all are really slow today. It's okay. Hey, the train's going to catch up. Just, just slow down a little bit. 
The good news is this. If you're running, God loves you enough to allow a storm to come. God loves you enough to create a fish. And I don't know what your fish is, but he's going he's to gather you in a, in a place that you can't move very good, but you can listen very well. And sometimes we need, need to be in a place where we can't move very good, but we can listen very, very well. Because it's there at that point of listening, it's there at that point that God is confronting us, that God begins to work in us. Yes, it's about the masses. Yes, it's about the soul. Yes, it is. But it's also about you. It's about me. It's about us living on mission. See God's character. He's just. He's, he's forgiving. He's compassionate. He's merciful. See his character. He loves you. And surrender to his call in your life. Let us pray. Father, I ask today. I ask that you'll take my, my, my feeble words, God, and I pray that the Holy Spirit will take those words, speak directly to each one. God, I think all of us, well, I know all of us are prone to running. And possibly each one of us in this room, to some degree or another, we run in some area of our life. So, Lord, I pray today, I pray, God, that if we're running west when you said go east, I pray that we'll have an immediate turn. God, it could, be, it could be in relation to our marriage. It could be in, relationship to a, uh, in, in relation to a relationship we're in. Maybe it's not good, it's not healthy, it's not godly, it's not spiritual. God, it could be it could be a career. It could just be our path in general. We just, we just may be running from God just in general, just, just everything. I mean, we, we, we have a fear of God. We have a love. We, we know who he is, but we're just not surrendering. So, Lord, speak to us. As our head is bowed and our eyes are closed, the way I want to give the invitation today, really the only way I know how to give it today in the environment that we're in in this moment is to ask you to identify in your life if you're a runner. You're running. You're running in some area of your life. Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's in God's plan. Maybe you're running physically you just can't be content wherever you're at and you're dis discontent as our head is bowed and our eyes are closed a very personal moment you hear and you say pastor I'm running and I don't even know why I'm running but I find myself identifying with Jonah today and I don't want to run I don't want to go in the wrong direction I don't even know what that means right now but I just know I got to say I'm running. I don't want to run no more. If that's you, lift your hand right now. Just lift it. Come on. God loves you. I see that hand. I see those hands. God's working. You at home, just identify. Just begin to say, I see that hand. Yes, God's working. God's moving. God loves you. I see those hands. God loves you. God's got a plan for you. God's got a purpose for you. God's got a destiny. God's not finished with you. Mm. Somebody needs to hear that. God's not finished with you. There's an anointing on your life. God's not finished with you. God's going God's to do some great things. Be planted, be planted, be planted right now. Today's the day of salvation. Today's the day to surrender. Today's the day of saying, here I am, God. Take all of me. Today is the day to say, Lord, I'm sorry. Lord, I repent. Lord, I confess my need of you. And I pray that God's hands of mercy will be shown upon your life. Can we all stand together right now? Will you lift your hands toward heaven? Will you begin to worship the Lord? Begin to ask God to help you. Begin to ask God to reveal himself to you. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus.